Today I'm doing a little different video. I'm talking cases for your more permanent electronics projects. Here in front of me I have an array of cases that I've made for various electronics projects that I've done over the years. As you can see some of them are metal cases bought that way and others are wooden cases that I've fabricated myself. Over there in the chair there's some more wooden cases. As you can see my preference is for wood and perspex for homemade cases and prefabricated metal cases. These metal cases that you see here on top of the wooden box these metal cases were purchased from either RS or Allied or Radio Shack in the 70s. I used to order from Allied Electronics and there was a company RS Components in Britain that we used to buy stuff from when I was in the security industry. So as you can see we can either buy a case and drill some holes in it and mount whatever we want or we can build a wooden case and we're going to look at the inside and how we fabricate inside as you can see here I have a metal front panel with knobs and uh, once you go to metal it's a little harder to work than wood so generally I would not make a complete metal case I would use metal maybe for a panel or some other purpose now I have notice I have tape over the ventilation holes in that case it's yellow tape and it's blue tape in the other box there is nothing in these cases that generates heat so it's okay those are ventilation holes provided if the case requires ventilation but by taping up those holes it prevents dust and bugs from going in and interfering with the electronics some of these boxes have not been stored differently here we have a calculator from the 70s made with telephone keyboard uh, three touch tone telephones with a cutout for the keys that we want for the matrix and a small LED display at the time this calculator was made LCDs hadn't yet been invented. All of these projects that you're observing were made between the years of 1975 and 1979. Now the other thing that we want to touch on the other thing that we want to touch on is connections between cases and interconnections between the rest of the world. We've used three different types of connectors in connecting our projects together to make the whatever device we're trying to make because some cases we have a modular device where everything is not contained in the same box. As you can see here we have the conventional uh, quarter inch uh, shielded jack like what we use with guitars, keyboards and musical instruments. Here we have the conventional what is called banana jacks and here we have another connector that is smaller than a banana jack but um, was very widely used in England and for gramophones and speaker connections uh, particularly with speakers back in the early radiograms of the early 70s. As you can see, this is the standard banana jack. And these here are the smaller English speaker connectors that I was telling you about. Now what about what about shielding? Wood does not provide shielding for sensitive electronics and um, you're going to have to use either some kind of metal or foil these are low speed digital projects that did not require shielding and I tended to use a perspex front panel wherever 
there was LEDs that needed to be monitored. The Perspex panel kept out the dust while allowing various LED displays whether there were LEDs in discrete LEDs or seven segment readouts to be shown. What about the switches and other displays? Many of the switches came also from Allied Radio Spares or Radio Shack and the other lamp indicators these here use actually um, bulbs that you can um, unscrew the bezel here and replace from the front which is a very neat situation I'll show you how it happens here you just unscrew the the lens and there is your bulb which is easily removed and changed and it's a filament bulb so it's better to have this front loading filament bulb than to have to disassemble your unit the red and orange here um, display things are obviously neon these are neon so the choice of indicator whether you use LED incandescent bulb or neon depends on the part that it's playing in the respective circuits because if you're dealing with AC circuits it may be better to use an AC indicator neons will trigger in anything from 60 volts or more and uh, filament bulbs you can buy for any voltage and uh, depending on the application and the circuitry involved it might be much simpler to just use these type of indicators rather than this LEDs which is a new way of doing things now in this 270 cycle scan converter we had a, a number of circuits and so we selected the appropriate indicator for the appropriate function now as you can see we use dymo labeling in this particular case to indicate the functions of switches and lights so dymo labeling is quite a useful mechanism it's not the nicest or neatest looking but um, it's functionally satisfactory except that over a lot of years it can dry out and fall off here is an attenuator made completely out of a solid block of cedar we just took the cedar we gouged out the necessary um, space in a solid block so it didn't require any assembly uh, we gouged out what was needed we install the attenuator jacks and a front panel notice of the hardboard with the thing so this um, any shielding in there can be produ produced by foil as needed but depending on whether it's handling um, small signal or large signal or whether it's balanced or unbalanced clearly this attenuator but the purpose for which this attenuator was built the levels were not that low so shielding was not critical Here's another slightly more elaborate matrix uh, attenuator. As you can see, it's a little more complicated and it has more um, connections. And it has a front, a metal front panel and a plastic box. And you can buy these plastic boxes with or with either with metal or plastic front panels in a wide um, variety of sizes and then you just drill out the front for whatever you need to install if you have to put jacks in the side you drill in the side so these are ready-made cases four screws it comes off you can mount anything inside and you just have to uh, decide on what size you want to go with now here is an analog audio mixer built uh, around 1976 it has a neon light here um, and these are the level controls and in this particular case I don't know if you can see it I just use scotch tape and I wrote on it so I didn't bother with the dymo in this case and um, you, as you can see the scotch tape and the writing I don't know if I can zoom in on the writing the scotch tape and the writing has held up pretty well uh, considering that this was built in 1976 the scotch tape hasn't peeled off or dropped off this was a so-called magic tape and although it doesn't look quite as neat and nice as dynamite it is it has it has held up for the better part of 40 years 
Now because the back was wood and not metal at all, I actually just wrote in ink on the wood surface. It wasn't possible to write in ink on the um, metal, so that's why I had to use the scotch tape. But as you can see, or I don't know if you can see very well, I wrote on in pen on the actual surface of the hardboard. This is a this is a hardboard that lasts well, as you can see. It's a smooth, hard surface. The only thing that will destroy this um, thin hardwood is the water. It does. It doesn't stand up well to water. It swells and expands in water. It's some kind of compressed board. But as you can see, it's pretty thin, so it makes for good panels. So the the the, the panels that I used tended to be one of three types. I would either use I would either use this hardboard, smooth hardboard uh, panel. It's smooth on both sides, and as you can see, the thickness is not significant here. You can see the thickness on the side of it where it's screwed on. And uh, metal if needed or wanted. And uh, um, perspex as you saw wherever we needed a visual indication of LEDs or displays inside we tended to use the perspex. Let's uh, remove the cover. As you can see I had a beveled countersunk wooden screws going into the side panel so it would be quite instructive now to lift off the cover so that we might inspect how I went about designing the inside as you can see over here on the left looking from the front I have a bell transformer a small bell transformer produced uh, the right voltage and current handling capacity for it. So the bell transformer is going into a board here, conventional analog rectifier with a um, filter here on the left side. Here is the the AC neon. And then we have this internal metal structure which is holding all the pots so that the pots are not actually screwed on to the front panel at all. The pots are screwed on to this internal aluminum surface and just come through smaller holes so that the knobs may go on on the outside. Now down below there is the main board as you can see it's not very large. That is actually an etch board that I etched with um, the ferric sulfate or whatever. Um, that so that board was I I planned I planned that board and etched it and um, I'm using field effect transistors and then at the back I just have tack soldered the various resistors and capacitors needed onto the switches multi position switches for setting the as you can see those old resistors are a little large but it was a question of working with what was available uh, because back in the 70s we did not always have access down in Barbados to the latest electronic parts my philosophy was to use what was available locally and only import what was absolutely essential to be imported now we have a board here on the right side sort of like a pre-amplifier board with more transistors and as you can see, I hope you can see in the video, it's mounted on, we have a metal foil and we're using a plastic surface to present a plastic surface separates the metal foil from the actual board. So there is no harsh soldering underneath, it's all smooth and neat that will puncture through or a plastic surface to make contact with our metal foil and our metal foil is grounded even with the bottom board with by means of a solder lug remember those there is a solder lug there screwed into the metal chassis and um, so we have everything nicely protected from 
hum and noise, hum and noise. Keeping hum and noise down in sensitive audio equipment was the biggest challenge in the 1970s. And it's an entirely analog device. And it had a fairly low noise floor, as low as I could get it. And uh, we achieved this uh, low noise floor, as I said, by careful shielding, as, as is shown here in this video, and uh, also avoiding ground loops. Now in this box, we primarily have low voltage regulation. So as you can see, I have our popular 7805 and 7812 uh, one amp regulators, those are three terminal one amp regulators. I'm sure users will be familiar with your 7805 and 7812, they're still popular products. And uh, notice what I've done to increase their um, heat capacity. Even though the box is sealed, I don't have an airflow in and out of the box, I have this large aluminum surface which I have bent, I, I cut with the hacksaw and bent uh, fins of my own right near to where they are. Notice the fins and tabs on the metal. And it's only really an amp that it's sinking and the, 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 the way that you control the actual heat in the regulator itself is by not having too big a delta between your input voltage and your output voltage. So if the delta is small, then the power dissipation of the product is not going to be horrendous. But just like uh, suspenders on a belt, we have a good heat sink capability there to radiate the heat from the IC chips into the surrounding space. It's a nice box space that you have. It works. I tend to prefer to use these um, connector strips. These are the same type of connector strips that the electricians use except that I get them in a very small size. You saw that already also in my um, clock. Those people who have already watched the uh, video of my digital clock that I built would see that it's always been a favorite of mine to use screw connectors where possible to allow for easy installation, reconfiguration, and so forth. Finally, we wanted to show you that everything works. So we just turned it on and we have a zero there in our display. Hope you can see that. And then we're going to enter 12 plus 3 equals 15. And lo and behold, when we look at our display, you can see 15 there. It really worked. Then we type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So there you're seeing all of the digits. So it's really a good functioning calculator. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.